Welcome to Monterey County Pops Pros Teach. I'm Carl Christensen, the music director and conductor of Monterey County Pops. Our orchestra of fully professional musicians presents free concerts of pops and patriotic music throughout Monterey County. During the school year, we visit local schools and conduct clinics and workshops for student musicians in the afternoon. And in the evening, we perform together in a free concert for their community. We are committed to mentoring young musicians, and since we have not been able to visit schools since March, we have created this series of instrumental clinics. They will be broadcast once a week on Comcast Channel 24, and they will also be posted on our website, montereycountypops.org, along with downloadable exercises, tips, and other print material. Bienvenido a Monterey County Pops Pros Teach. Soy Carl Christensen, director musical de Monterey County Pops. Nuestra orquesta de músicos totalmente profesionales presenta conciertos gratuitos de música ligera y patriótica en todo el condado de Monterrey. Durante el año escolar visitamos escuelas y realizamos clínicas y talleres para estudiantes músicos por la tarde y por la noche presentamos un concierto conjunto para su comunidad. Para nosotros, la educación musical de jóvenes músicos es muy importante y como no hemos podido visitar escuelas desde marzo, hemos creado esta serie de clínicas instrumentales. Se transmitirán una vez a la semana en el canal 24 de Comcast y también se publicarán en nuestro sitio web montereycontipops.org junto con ejercicios consejos y otro material impreso descargable. And now please enjoy our viola episode presented by a member of our viola section, Brian Brash. Y ahora disfruten de nuestro episodio de la viola presentado por Brian Brash. Hi, my name is Brian Brash. I play the viola, which is an odd-looking violin, which we'll talk about later. Um, I chose to play this instrument because it was sort of just handed to me, quite literally, um, as I walked into a classroom. Uh, I didn't know what it is, but I was curious enough about what it was to, to kind of delve a little bit deeper into the sound. And the sound really grabbed a hold of me when I heard a wonderful piece by... Johann Sebastian Bach for all violas, the concerto number six, Brandenburg concerto number six, and I completely fell in love. Um, I practiced for millions of hours and eventually got into a music conservatory in Boston, the Boston Music Conservatory, where they asked me to practice for two million more hours, um, which is pretty necessary for getting to know your instrument as intimately as possible. Um, after that, I sort of did some teaching at an arts high school in Boston uh, for a little while, um, trying to get people to do the thing that I did for so many years and fall in love with it in the same way that I did. Um, after that, I took a break from teaching and did more performing. So I traveled across the country on tour with musicians. Um, I did The Tonight Show a couple of times. I've played the Grammy Grammys. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just doing as much as I could to engage myself as fully as possible in all facets of this instrument. So we're going to talk about it. First of all, how do you build this thing? I not physically build it, but how do you get one? How do you get started? Uh, and some of the things you need to know before you get started. Um, so picking an instrument. Um, I've never played the violin. I played the violin after I started playing the viola, um, and for a couple of reasons. For me, personally, I liked the voice of the instrument. So um, interestingly enough, in, in music, it's almost always the female voice, so if that helps. Um, but it was a richer, darker, more rounded tone than the violin, and, and it was sort of, I thought, as I discovered the the unsung hero of the orchestra. Don't tell violinists I told you that, but it's true. So the viola sound... It's just richer and darker, um, which is more appealing to me. 
So if that's appealing to you, this is the instrument to, to go for. Um, in, in a lot of cases, if you are a younger person, you can still start on the viola. Um, as you can see, it's, especially this one, it's quite large. Um, this is a 16 and 7 eighths inch viola. Um, and violins, I believe, go to 15 at, at the most. Um, so you do have to be kind of a taller person with bigger fingers. They do make them in different sizes, but um, you are going to run into having a larger instrument if you play the viola up on your shoulder. Um, so if you're a younger person starting the instrument, you will essentially get a small or a big-ish violin um, to start on. And it doesn't, I get, this, I get this question a lot where parents say, well, should I buy an instrument or should I rent an instrument? I recommend that if you're starting this instrument, doesn't matter what age you're starting this instrument, I always recommend renting the instrument first um, for a number of reasons. You don't know if you're going to like it in a year, um, but you also change quite a bit over that course of time. Um, so as you grow your instrument, you'll outgrow your instrument essentially, and to buy and keep buying and buying gets quite expensive. So I always say rent the instrument first. Um, the good thing about renting the instrument is that a lot of what I'm going to talk about now will get taken care of. You know, your string set up, your bow set up, what kind of case you should get, all of that stuff if you're renting an outfit um, will come sort of ready-made on the instrument. Um, strings are kind of interesting because it's a, it's a personal preference thing after a while. You know, I would typically go for just a, a set of dominant strings. The company's called Dominance. Um, or it's, is that Daddario? I can't remember. Um, but uh, the, the strings are called Dominance and um, they work really well on most instruments. You get a nice solid sound. They're not tremendously expensive or, or they didn't used to be. Um, but uh, you can pick up a, a nice set of dominance for viola for 40 or $50. Um, and then onto the bow. Like I said, the bow will come as a part of the outfit if you're renting the instrument. A lot of times if you buy it, may or may not come with the instrument. Um, but the bow has a couple of components to it. It has the stick, which is the wooden bit usually. Some of them now are coming in carbon fiber or fiberglass. Um, which are pretty durable bows and really nice ones, actually made by Coda, I think. Um, so you've got the stick, you've got the hair, and you've got the frog and the tip. Um, tip is really sensitive. I've broken several of them. Um, the frog is usually the more ornate part of the bow, uh, and the stick is also quite fragile because it's a very thin piece of wood. Uh, the hair is the only part of the bow that really needs a fair amount of maintenance so depending on how much you practice or how much you play you'll you know rehair the bow or change the hairs out you know every you know six to eight months or something like that depending on uh, how much you play uh, if you're just starting out probably a year before you'll need to replace it if you do a lot of touching of the bow it does tend to get sticky and you'll have to replace it um, after that uh, the instrument, in terms of the care of the instrument, it's not much, you know, it's not as involved as some of the wind instruments. You just want to make sure you clean the rosin off of the strings and off of the actual instrument itself. Uh, it does tend to build up. Um, and really, honestly, as, as well as you could try to remove as much of the rosin, rosin as possible, and rosin is the substance we put on our bow to make it sticky, uh, it still does get build up build up on there, so you may want to go and get it professionally cleaned every couple of years or something like that, so it doesn't become a permanent fixture on your instrument. Um, but other than that, it's really a matter of replacing the strings. You know, you clean it like you clean your car, just because you want it to look pretty. Um, but the strings do get false, um, so the, um, the core of the pitch, you'll hear it kind of wavering, uh, or you'll start to see um, it become unwound at the bottom or up here at the top, and it's time to change the strings after that. Um, but it's relatively easy to take care of. Um, this particular instrument um, was delivered to the violin maker in a trash bag. So uh, they're, they're more durable than they seem. Um, I just wouldn't go smashing it anywhere, because it is wood, obviously. Um, 
So once you've gotten your instrument, you picked out your viola, obviously, um, and you're ready to start learning, you're ready to um, go down that road, or maybe you've already been down that road and you wanna go further. Um, some things that I typically see with students, honestly, of, of any age and, and, and level, um, is with the right hand. The left hand is, I don't wanna say it's easy, but it's more intuitive, right? We do this a lot as, as just people, right? We're, our fingers thing, that's just what they do. Um, but the bow is quite interesting because I saw somewhere once that this instrument with the bow was essentially designed not to make a good sound. Um, and where you place the bow on the instrument makes a huge difference there. Um, and you have a very small uh, window of success with the bow. Um, so I love to um, give my students um, uh, sort of a quality time in, uh, etudes with their instruments. Uh, and I mean long tone scales. Uh, there is actually a book called Viola Aerobics um, that walks you through all of these exercises, has a thing called the minute bow, which if you want to annoy your friends, you'll do. Right, you're supposed to pull a down bow for an entire minute, which is very difficult. But you could just simply do a long tone scale, take a whole note, you know, get your metronome out, put it on 60 of the quarter note or something like that, and see how beautiful you can make your sound. And so on. The goal is to have the sound never ever change. You wanna make it consistent from the frog to the tip, and the more you do it, you'll realize why that's a difficult thing. And you'll figure it out. I really rarely have to say anything else about it except do that exercise and make it consistent from frog to tip. And you are more than on your way to making an absolute beautiful sound, you know, acquainting yourself more with, with the left hand. Um, there are other etudes out there that can help you with the right hand. Um, that will give you more sort of complex bowing variations. Um, one of them is by um, Sevchik, um, uh, and I think it's called Bowing Technique um, that you can pick up that walks you through various things. It, it essentially maps the bow for you and get you to know every square inch of the bow and how it's used and its difficulty and how to sort of overcome those difficulties. Um, so once you've kind of gone through those books and you are becoming more and more acquainted with the bow, and again, honestly, you know, it, it, I make up a lot of my etudes really based on a couple of principles. That slow practice principle um, is a really big one. And you'll get more out of doing a nice, long, slow scale than honestly you'll get out of playing through an entire etude book. Um, because it's, it's time spent learning how to do this. If you think about building muscles, you, know, you build muscles, with, it's time under tension that builds muscles, right? So you have time to really explore the bow and build those tiny, tiny, tiny little muscles that we use as string players quite a bit. Um, so once you've mastered the bow, whatever that is, you get to move on to the left hand. And I would honestly focus on it in that sequence of getting the right hand and then getting the left hand down. Um, you can move on to doing more sort of traditional etudes that um, walk you through more left hand technique stuff. One of the ones I love and one of the greatest challenges as uh, string players, or musicians in general, or instrumentalists in general, but string players, other than the, the, the right hand, is, is getting your intonation, is, is learning how to play properly. Because as you can see, unlike a guitar, we don't have frets. I think at one point we did, you know, with the old um, uh, early music instruments there, like the gamba family and things like that, they had frets, but we don't anymore. So we really do have to just rely on our memory of, and our ear uh, of where those notes were. Um, and a good way to do that, we talked about that earlier, 
is doing slow scales, or just scales in general, to get uh, the pitch in your ear and under your fingers. Right? Every viola's favorite scale, the C major scale. Okay? Once you've gotten that in your ear and under your fingers, you know, you keep up the consistency of scales because we forget. So you want to do scales every single day without fail. Um, and then you can combine that with an etude, which is, you know, it's essentially scales and, and, and um, right hand technique combined in a very melodic, uh, appealing way. Um, uh, one of the etudes I usually recommend first is, is the Wolfhart um, etudes. Uh, it walks you through really uh, in a very uh, progressive way. It, it doesn't start too difficult or doesn't get too difficult that quickly, uh, like um, you know Kreutzer or Kaiser. Um, it gives you a chance to really get to know the instrument before it starts throwing, you know, before you learn to do all sorts of fun tricks on the instrument. Um, as you go through, and I know every student comes to me and says, well, how do you do that wiggly thing with your finger? And we become obsessed with the wiggly thing. It does look impressive, um, but I will caution you to get your intonation, get your scales, and get your muscle memory down first before you worry about doing the wiggly thing, which is called vibrato. Um, there are early musicians that do Baroque music and Renaissance music that seldom use vibrato and it still sounds very beautiful because they have good technique. But once you do get a handle on the intonation, you can move on to uh, vibrato, which is a great expressive tool um, and helps you create all sorts of colors once you learn how to use you know, varying vibratos. Um, so the, the essential idea is that you're, you're sort of just waving at yourself, right? But with your fingers down. Right? Um, so it's a very fun, expressive tool. The two that you have, the bow, and that vibrato, um, you know, as you learn dynamics and phrasing um, and, um, and um, just tone production, uh, you kind of use all of those together to create, well, music. <laughs> you create the, the thing that people love to hear, which is um, this very emotional experience for them. Um, speaking of emotions, this instrument, oh gosh, I had a, I had a teacher once that, that said, the only time there's a viola solo is in an opera when someone's about to die. Um, and it's kind of true. Um, or in a horror movie, you'll always know when something terrible is about to happen because you'll hear violas. Um, and it works so well, it has this very eerie, hollow tone um, to it that, that I love. Um, and I think is, you know, to me, more expressive um, than the violin that can, can be sad and, and, and mournful as well, um, but because of its higher pitch has more of a, a jovial quality to it. Um, so the, the lower strings, especially on the viola, you notice I've been playing on the C string, this low string, and the G string a lot. Um, those for me are the two richest strings in, in, uh, on the viola. And most really very good composers will always have an open C thrown in there somewhere, or C minor, if you're thinking more sad. Um, so moving on to some of those composers. Um, the thing about the viola is that it was, um, I, I'm going to say became popular, but I don't know if it was ever really popular um, um, sort of in its day. Uh, it's more popular now than it ever has been. It, people didn't compose that much for the instrument. Um, so most of what you're going to find in terms of repertoire, things that were written for the viola, um, will come late Romantic, early 20th century and onward. Um, most of the stuff that we have prior to that, prior to the 1800s, 
will be you know, arrangements of pieces for the viola that were written for another instrument that just happened to work for the viola. Um, I think you guys probably know this, um, the Bach cello suites, great, great set of pieces to play for the viola, but it was originally written for cello. Of course, this famous one. <laughs> Right? Um, so that one, as much as you do hear it quite a bit on viola and is standard rep for the viola, was not written for the viola. You'll have to go uh, later in the 20th century. Why it is that these pieces weren't written for the viola, I, you know, again, it's just, we were the new kid on the block and no one liked us. Um, you know, there is a famous composer who wrote an absolutely beautiful uh, viola concerto called, named William Walton who uh, wrote this piece for a man named Lionel Turdis, I believe, and when he was asked um, if he would write this piece, he wrote back and he said, you know, to be honest, I don't know much about writing for the viola, and furthermore, I don't like it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, we're sort of the underdogs, and I like that about the viola. Um, but, you know, he did write the concerto, and he wrote an absolutely beautiful concerto, um, that if you are um, intermediate to advanced level, you will probably work on because it's a pretty standard uh, part of the rap. Or if you decide to audition for orchestras or anything like that, you'll more than likely get to a round where you'll have to play the Walton Concerto. Um, and then beyond that, uh, another really standard one, one that I grew up absolutely loving, uh, was the Bartok Concerto. Um, and the Bartok Concerto was written for a, a man that I idolized growing up, um, uh, William Primrose, a violist. Um, and you know, even that concerto was, was pretty hard uh, to, to get Bartok to write. A lot of these composers for viola tend to write uh, their big viola works later in their life, um, which you know, puts us at an advantage, I think, because it's it's their most mature work. The Bartok Viola Concerto, I grew, grew up, well, really trying to play for the longest time. It, it's an extremely difficult work um, that requires all sorts of finger acrobatics, uh, both in the right hand and the left hand. Um, and there have been several um, iterations of this piece, I think mainly because they're trying to make it more playable. Um, I do recommend going and listening to as many viola works or pieces, especially the modern ones, um, that you can find um, and acquaint yourself with. And I typically like to pick a performer that I really love. Not that you have to stick with just that performer, obviously I think you should listen to many different performances of that particular piece. You'll learn a lot about uh, how other people hear and interpret those pieces. Um, but, you know, it's nice to have, you know, a rock star, right? I mean, everybody has that band or that um, artist that they really love um, and, and keep around. Uh, for me, it was William Primrose, and then, you know, I became obsessed with Patricia McCarty, and then eventually I got to study with her, um, which was great. Um, you know, there's Kim Kashkashian, not Kim Kardashian. <laughs> that happens a lot to her. Um, and um, Tabe Zimmerman, who's a German violist, fantastic. One of the only violists out there that started when she was three on the viola. So I encourage you to go out and listen to as many violists as, as you can and, and pick ones that, um, that really kind of speak to you. So it's sort of, you know, you found your voice with the viola. Now it's time to, f you know, find a friend that shares that same, uh, that same voice. Um, Talking a little bit more about, I know I, I brought up the, the Bartok Concerto and, and all these sort of acrobatics that exist in, in, in playing the instrument. Um, and speaking earlier about one of the more difficult parts being the right hand, um, there are a couple of different techniques that, that one can learn or needs to learn um, for um, you know, doing anything, honestly, from Mozart all the way up to you know, Bartok. Uh, one is called staccato, right? So staccato, essentially, these are all uh, short clipped bowings, 
but with staccato you keep the bow on the string. Right? Um, and then there's a variation of that called martelé. Right? Which is essentially just adding more bow to the string. The great thing about martelé is it, it gets you acquainted with this guy here, which is sort of, um, you know, this is sort of your right foot on your gas pedal and your brake. Right? Um, so it, it starts and stops the bow a lot. So getting this worked out with Martelet is really great. Um, it's necessary to do this next one. It's necessary to have a degree of flexibility in your hand, especially the thumb. I have this problem where I have to get this winding replaced a lot because I have a stiff thumb. Um, but doing this other one called Spiccato, um, which is the same short bow stroke, but now we sort of let it uh, bounce off the string, right? Um, I always think it's really funny in German, it's called Springenbogen, right? Because it's, 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 it's a springy bow. And they're like uh, with staccato, there are several different ways that you can play a spiccato. Um, a more brushy stroke, which is used a lot uh, in classical era music. <laughs> Um, so there's uh, a little bit more space uh, or more hair really on the bow. Um, you have shorter spiccato. Right? That's more sort of picky. Um, you even have um, kind of a combination of the two. Uh, this is called sautier. Where it's sort of on the string, but off the string at the same time. You sort of use that flexibility to get the bow. Um, I mean, I have always been taught that you need to find the balance point in your bow, and that's where it bounces the best. But I think it, it differs depending on if you're doing spiccato here, which you will be asked to do, or doing more of a, an aggressive... Um, um, right, you'll need to have it in the lower part of the bow. Um, and all of these things are, are things you can experiment with, and I encourage you to experiment with, and I encourage you to use scales to experiment with them, right? It's, it's not just, that's not just like a teacher trick where we try to trick you to do scales. Uh, it's more just doing something that is really simple. It's just putting one finger in front of the other so that you can focus on doing um, whatever technique that you're working on. Um, you know, if you were to do it directly in a piece that you have to worry about 700 different things, it would be quite difficult. Um, so I do encourage you to use scales. To do, practice your staccato and spiccato. And remember, relax. Um, so let's talk about um, work. As a violist, um, you know, and it, I have a hard time saying this now because I think in the past, you know, it was always said to me that, you know, how do you spell scholarship? V-I-O-L-A, which is true. I did get a scholarship because I play this instrument and you'll probably get one too. Um, but things are becoming more and more and more competitive um, in the viola world. And I think really that's a good thing in, in a number of ways. Um, I think the demand for violists is, has grown. Um, I mean, I've done entire, you know, three, I think I've done three albums where it was just, they only wanted the viola. They didn't want any other instrument, no violins, no cello. So I think the demand for the instrument is getting greater. So there are more opportunities out there. Um, and I think that after, you know, uh, decades, people are finally starting to realize the versatility of this instrument. Um, and so they're, they're flocking to it, you know. Um, you know, just let a violinist play the viola and he'll never go back. Um, so, you know, you do have a lot of opportunities when you play this instrument. You know, there's, the, in, in the string quartet, um, you almost always have 
the viola. And I didn't mention this, but I played in a string quartet when I lived out on the East Coast for several years. Um, and it's my favorite group or ensemble to play in um, because you have such a, a, a role and a presence as a violist in a string quartet because of, of really the notes you play and, and, and the, the position that you occupy in that setting. Um, it's similar in the orchestra where, you know, you're, you're sort of the middle voice. Um, but I feel for me in string quartet, there's so much more to say for the violist. Uh, listen to uh, the Janáček String Quartet number one, I believe, Intimate Letters. Um, it is all about this instrument, and it's done in such a clever way that I think performing that piece, again, as difficult as it was, it made me fall in love with this instrument so much more because I heard it in a way that I had never heard it before. Um, so explore string quartets. Um, there, you know, a lot of people say that composers save their best material for their string quartets. It's always more intimate and um, um, poignant, I think. Um, so yeah, this is the viola, and I'm Brian. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thank you.